Good evening. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I can't tell you how excited I am to see real live people in three dimensions. Thank you again for coming out. I know Salem traffic was a little scary today, but we all made it. Oh, you can't. Oh, am I? Uh, do I need to lean in closer? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So um, I, you're, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see you all. And, and I also like to welcome people who did decide that they want to do sit on their couch tonight and watch via Zoom. I appreciate you joining us no matter how you chose to do so. Um, so if you don't know already, I'm Constance Lapide, president of the Essex County Ornithological Club. Uh, if you have come here to hear about the wonderful interaction between science and art to help alert people to the threat to climate change to our salt marshes, you've come to the right place. That presentation will start at 7.45, right after this brief ECOC meeting. So uh, we are back with another engaging speaker series, thanks to Janie Winchell. Um, Friday, November 4th, Dr. Rebecca Kleinberger will talk to us about our work making zoos a happier place for animals through sound engineering. Uh, zoos can expose the disconnect between humans and other species by displaying the imbalance between visitors who want to be entertained and animals that are looking for some more meaningful engagement. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kleinberger will present our collaboration with zoos, wildlife experts, and preservation centers to benefit animals in managed care using technology such as sound engineering uh, for animals and birds. So that's Friday, November 4th. And on Friday, December 9th, we are um, happy to bring back Dr. Doug Tallamy. He'll talk to us about oak trees. If that does not sound exciting to you, you have not heard Dr. Tallamy speak. Uh, oaks support more species of animals, sequester more carbon, protect watersheds, and nourish soil communities better than any other plant genus in North America. When it comes to the race in preserving environments in our backyards for natural habitat, oaks are definitely in the lead. Uh, Dr. Tallamy will discuss these roles by following the many fascinating things that are happening in the oaks in his yard every single month. That event is made possible by a generous gift from the Echo Charitable Foundation, co-sponsored by Peabody Essex Museum. Both of these events will be right here in Morse Auditorium on a Friday at 7.45, again, right after a 7.30 ECOC meeting. I really hope you'll join us. And the other announcement I have is that the ECOC bulletins, which are wonderful pieces of history that were held by the uh, library here, the Phillips Library, have been digitized and are available electronically. So you can peek back in history from 1919 to 1938 just by clicking, clicking on a link on the ECOC website. Uh, these are free to download or just peruse. I encourage you to take a look back. Uh, they're really fascinating. Does anybody else have any announcements? It's very quiet in here. And I'm gonna say right now, I'm sorry if you're, you're trying to tell me about an announcement. Uh, on the web, we're not able to take questions over chat today. Um, so feel free to email us later. So not seeing any, I will move on to the treasurer's report. Mary Stevens, would you like to give us a report? It's entirely up to you. Oh, that's right. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. We are kicking off our next member year, uh, 2022 to 23, this month. So um, it's time to renew. Currently, we have in the checking account $4,782.61. And that's after honoraria and others. So uh, we're doing pretty well. I am here with my decals tonight. If anyone needs new ones for your new vehicles, or maybe for your old vehicle. You can never really have too many. So um, short and sweet, that's pretty much it, I think. So um, I'm here if you want to renew tonight. It's uh, $15 per household or $12 per person. 
and the decals are a dollar. So it's still a great deal. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Love the mask. That's right. And I would say up now before inflation hits the ECOC. So it's a little harder to see you now, but I want to hear about bird sightings. What have people been seeing? Don't be shy. I just remind people about. Oh. And, and um, our, our lovely assistant, Janie, <laughs> will be uh, helping you with that. Please, don't be shy. I saw two piping plovers and a couple of, of um, sandpipers right at uh, Winter Island yesterday morning. I don't usually see them there. Excellent. Who else had some good sightings? Oh, Sure, why not? Um, the uh, Following up on Plum Island, the uh, shorebird migration is well underway, and uh, the star of the summer was an American avocet that hung out for two months uh, at Stage Island, and uh, and there have been golden plovers coming through, and now the clay-colored sparrows are coming through, and uh, so the the show is still uh, rolling. So if you haven't been up to Plum lately, this is a great time to go, as though any time of year isn't a great time to go. Thank you, Leah. As that gentleman in the uh, tenth row. To pile on Jim's uh, Newburyport trip, if you were going to see the Avocet, you might have stopped by Perkins Park, uh, which there was quite a evening or morning and evening roost for the past month. Is it still there? Is anybody it's broken up by now? Uh, yeah, that was fascinating. Uh, I hope it, of? of heron okay. mixed with an added treat of many wood duck. Yeah. You had to be tall, I heard. <laughs> now, the yellow crown night herons complemented the dozen or so black crowns, and <laughs> it was just quite an event. If you had the opportunity, it's a regular roost, so it's good to know about that. Perkins Park in Newbury Park uh, in the summer often had a roost in the event. That is now on the map. Oh, yeah. So, um, hot tip uh, Perkins Cove in Newbury, Perkins Park, sorry, in Newbury Port is a great place to catch some herons migrating in and out. So, um, Check it out next fall, spring, next summer. Okay. Roosting during the breeding season. Who else had some sightings? Okay, you guys got to get out there this weekend because we're going to expect a report in about a month. Thank you very much. Uh, and after sightings, I'd like to ask Don Paul to give us a book of the month. Don? Uh, it's so good to see people again. This is wonderful. And hello to people who are on Zoom. You're probably the people who are actually going to be able to see this best if you're on Zoom. But um, this is a, um, one of a series of 21 books uh, written by Arthur Cleveland Bent, who was um, an ornithologist, um, an amateur ornithologist, um, despite writing 21 books, uh, Life Histories of North American Birds. And so he's done a series of all different birds. This is on marsh birds in honor of uh, our subject matter tonight. And um, he wrote these, uh, you know, these books were being published around the turn of the century. The, the century from uh, the 19th century to the 20th. Uh, he was born in 1866 and died in 1954, was sort of his life range. And um, they're interesting reads because it's interesting to see 
sort of what was going on with birds in, in those days. And also just the, the information about the birds themselves does not really change that much. So they're kind of timeless in that sense. Uh, the book that I, I'm holding now, I think, is probably what's around in bookstores. Um, you know, if you can't get some of the old antique originals. And these are Dover editions. And if you're familiar with those publishers, the Do Dover publishers, they take books that are kind of in the public realm where they don't have to pay for them, and they just copy them. So what's in this book looks like a book from the early 1900s, which is kind of interesting also. So his name is Arthur Cleveland Bent. Um, and I'd always thought of him as this kind of man who, you know, just sat around a lot watching birds, writing down everything about them, and um, sort of reading up to give you this information tonight. Um, I was checking out his bio biographical information, and he was actually this whirlwind of activity. He was um, a very successful business person, ran a lot of different businesses, very uh, civic minded, and with all that still managed to write a book like once every year or two years while he was working on this series. Uh, so Arthur Cleveland Bent, if you don't already have some of his books, they're well worth investing in. Thank you. And without further ado, here's Janie Winchell to introduce tonight's speaker. Janie is the ECOC Program Director and Director of the Art and Nature Center of Peabody Essex Museum. Janie. Hi, everyone. And for those of you that are coming in, um, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, we're just wrapping up our, our club meeting. And Welcome to this evening's presentation, The Once and Future Salt Marsh. This is the first co-hosted ECOC and PEM event that we've had in person since February of 2020. It's really great to see you all here and not in little boxes. As Constance said, I'm Janie Winchell, and in my dual roles here, at PEM and with the ECOC, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our wonderful speakers this evening, Susan Quaitman, Leslie Bartlett, and Robert Buxbaum, one of our own from ECOC. One of Susan Quaitman's silk paintings of a salt marsh sparrow is actually featured in the Climate Action Inspiring Change exhibition currently on view in the Art and Nature Center. I am very grateful to Susan and her daughter, Emma, for their collaborative installation in this show, which I hope you will make an effort to see if you haven't already. Susan moved to the US from London in 1980 to take a master's degree in city and regional planning at Cornell University. Following a career in landscape and landscape preservation, environmental planning, and landscape design in the Boston. This is the intro. And to design and paint landscapes on silk wearables and banners in 2009. She has been collaborating with photographer Leslie Bartlett for the past six years. Together, they have created art and science exhibits that focus on climate change and possible solutions for entities ranging from the Essex County Greenbelt, Mass Audubon, the National Park Service here in Salem, and the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, where you'll find their once and future salt marsh installation now. Les spent his childhood in a farming landscape in Epsom, New Hampshire, but has been a longtime resident of Cape Ann. As a photographer for the last two decades, he has wandered through the abandoned quarries of Cape Ann and New England. His dramatic large scale quarry images have been exhibited on Cape Ann, in Soho Photo in New York City, and in the Vermont Granite Museum. Robert Buxbaum served as technical advisor for the Once and Future Salt Marsh project. He recently retired as a conservation scientist with Mass Audubon, where he carried out environmental research and advised the organization on ecological issues for over 30 years. 
He received his BS in natural resources from Cornell and his PhD in uh, marine, bio marine ecology from BU's marine biology program at Woods Hole. Robert has a particular interest in how climate change is affecting both fauna and flora of salt marshes in wetland restoration and in how human activities are affecting coastal wetlands. He has written numerous technical and non-technical articles on environmental subjects and is the author of the Appalachian Mountain Club's Best Day Hikes in the White Mountains, which I highly recommend, and is a past president of ECOC. So without further ado, I hope you will join me in welcoming our three speakers to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. Leslie, you're going to do this, right? This is going to be interesting. <laughs> well, good evening, all, and good evening to those of you on Zoom land. Many thanks to Janie and the Peabody Essex Museum and the Essex County Ornithological Club for inviting Les, myself, and Robert to present the Once and Future Salt Marsh ex exhibition. And we are here tonight to tell the story of our project that now lives besides the marsh at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Is this working? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. Here's this, a slide of Les and myself at the Marblehead Arts Association, um, where we were presenting work on the resilient landscape. As you heard from Janie, I'm originally from England, from London, and um, moved here to, to study environmental planning and became a silk painter in 2010. And we've been collaborating for about six years now. And this is Les. You're going to see us moving back and forth here, okay? Um, I'm Les Bartlett. Uh, the anecdote, uh, anecdote I want to share is that when Susan came to my printing studio some 10 years ago, I said, get out of here. I only print for myself. I don't print for anybody else. And she persisted. And I think we're here today because of her great instinct and persistence. Um, so it's, it's the image you see behind here is from us in Marblehead at the Marblehead Arts Association, where we had been rolling through a number of exhibits, which finally get us to this wonderful moment of these little marsh critters. Okay. Okay. Oops. Okay, hold on. We're there. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I want to introduce you to the scientists and collaborators who helped us make this project of art informed by science. On the left, we have Robert Buxbaum, who is also on my left. And then on the right, Jane Tucker and Anne Giblin. And Robert will explain a little bit more about their roles in this project. So, um, I'm part of, uh, through Mass Audubon, working on this major effort called the Plum Island Ecosystems Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And uh, Anne Giblin, who's somebody I've known since graduate school, in fact, she was a very big influence on my life. She's the one who convinced me to go to this BU program. Um, she's the uh, lead PI, lead principal investigation for, investigator for this program. and. Uh, and uh, Jane Tucker is, is a longtime collaborator and research associate is working with, with, Jane, with Anne on this project. So this is a part of the long-term ecological research program is, is a National Science Foundation effort. So there's something like 26 sites across the country in which the idea is to fund um, programs to, to look at changes, often human-induced changes um, related to climate and other factors um, they, they go from uh, Alaska to the to Antarctica and Plum Island is one of the coastal um, LTERs as the acronym so if we use that acronym LTER it stands for long term ecological research program so it's been an important part of my professional career at Mass Audubon when I was there to work on this project and work uh, with these guys.
In 2018, Susan and I both attended the Great Marsh Coalition Symposium, where Susan gave a talk on, talk on landscape in the Great Marsh. Here we went, met Nancy Pow, depicted in the slide, a biologist at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, and local expert on climate change and the marsh. Nancy was a key collaborator for us in this project. So the friends of the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge very kindly acted as the fiscal nonprofit sponsor for this project, and we're very um, grateful for their help. In 2015, I attended the Great Marsh Coalition Symposium with Candace Wheeler, who is a fellow city planner and one of my co-administrators at our silk painting studio, Ten Pound Studio, which is based in Gloucester. At this coalition meeting, I saw a huge gap between the words used by the climate scientists to explain what was happening to the marsh as a result of climate change and public understanding. Too much science often means too many words and not, of, uh, not enough understanding at a heart and gut level. Perhaps I thought art could bridge the gap. The refuge falls within the Great Marsh from Gloucester to Salisbury and includes Essex, Newburyport, Newbury, Rowley, and Ipswich. On the left of this slide is a wonderful aerial photograph taken by a friend of mine named Stefan Gersh. Whoops, wrong. Yep. Okay. So we produced a story, the once and future salt marsh for the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge about how climate change impacts the marsh as viewed through the lives of three different critters, the smelt, the fiddler crab, and the salt marsh sparrow. I worked very closely with Robert here, who I have actually known for years and years, in deciding which critters to focus on. And here we see the salt marsh, then know the rainbow smelt panel installed near lot one on the refuge. Okay, um, the whole idea was, uh, if you think about climate change and how you really illustrate it through art, it's very hard to take a look at a marsh where the changes happen very slowly over time. Um, and it's one thing that can, comes, has really hit me that I, I, I'm trying to give a demonstration where on the Great Marsh can I show something 20 years ago where it, lo where it looks like now. Just looking at the landscape, it can be very hard to pick that out. But if you focus on the creatures, the, the lives of the important things li that live there, it becomes uh, a, a much more compelling story to me than saying, well, you can see that ditch is a little wider or there's a little less marsh edge here. And so that's how we um, really focused on the, the smelt being the first one. Um, And here we see, here we see the salt marsh sparrow panel at the refuge. And the fiddler crab panel by Stage Island on the refuge. So to pick up on what Robert said about critters, we ended up doing this translation of scientific, scientific information on three living creatures, becoming these panels which are installed on the marsh itself. And it didn't just come out of the blue, just as the critters didn't come out of the blue. Susan and I have been described as being yin and yang, very different backgrounds. Um, we've been able to sit at a table and fight and discuss a lot, and then come out with the kind of work that makes sense to the general public. Well, I began my love with the marsh in 2004. And this is a photograph of the marsh at Jones River in Gloucester. Okay, change it, she says. There we go. Okay. 
All right, so this was, this was a part of a prize from the Nature Conservancy. We're not getting go, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll try to keep this colloquial, right? Um, this was a prize-winning photograph that the Nature Conservancy selected. And it's noteworthy in that they have no real properties on Cape Ann, as far as I know, to this point. And this haunting image of a marsh in October was in 2004, 2005, and it prepared me for this moment of working with Susan on um, these great projects. So back in 2016, I'd already taken to heart this huge question of how to communicate these climate issues and the salt marsh in a compelling and artistic way. Again, I wanted to hit people at the heart and the gut. And I had a question, could I use my silk art in a way to hit people in this, in this fashion? So I talked to my friends of 30 years. I talked to Ed Becker of Greenbelt, who I'm sure many of you know, to Robert Buxbaum, and when he was with Mass Audubon, and met with Peter Fippin of the Great Marsh Coalition. And with a lot of grit and determination, we managed to get an Essex Heritage Partnership Grant to create a public exhibit called Climate Change and the Great Marsh. So I produced four silk photographs and uh, silk, silk and photography banners with signage showing the problems and solutions to climate change on the salt marsh. And these were shown in the Cox Reservation, the Crane Estate Art Show, and Rough, Medlo Me Rough Meadows Wildlife Sanctuary in Rowley. These are two of the banners from the 2016 exhibit. On the left you can, is an illustration of sea level rise in the marshes. And the silk painting I did was um, actually showing the marshes from Argilla Road in Ipswich. And on the right, it shows the importance of opening culverts to, to permit the marshes to drain properly. And again, you can see it's a mixture of a silk painting on the top and a photograph on the bottom. No, back. <laughs> right, good. Here is another artistic way to explain the science of sea level rise. This, this was a project by Jim Seavey and the Cape Ann Climate Coalition, which I'm a member of. It's at the paint factory Ocean, owned by Ocean Alliance in Gloucester. And it shows how the sea will hit the building during mean high tide peak and storm periods between 2020 and 2100. And you can see the numbers on the le from left to right, 2020 20 to 2100. Um, no words, just images. Even Ian Kerr, who's the director of Ocean Alliance, was shocked to see how quickly the sea is predicted to rise. And who knows, it might be even higher than the predictions in this case by coastal zone management. I want to jump in for just a moment. Um, one thing that we haven't really made clear is we're not, it's not that we're working in parallel. It's not just that Susan has been getting information from the scientists, from Robert and other people, Anne and Jane, and producing a silk, and I'm doing a photograph. We're actually blending these together. And so that's been part of being at the same table and being contentious sometimes and agreeing a lot that it's a blend of silk painting and photography to produce a new effect. I just wanted to bring that in as being an important thing. Okay. So this is an example of something that takes a lot of words to explain. On the left, you see the trend for mean sea level rise in Boston from 1920 to 2010. It's forecast to rise by 1.3 feet in 2050, according to NOAA perhaps even five feet by 2100. On the, right, on the right is a graphic generated by the Plum Island Ecosystem Long-Term Ecological Research, which Robert's part of, showing the future consequences of sea level rise to the salt marsh at Plum Island. Increased flooding and storm surge means the low marsh, the Spartina alterniflora, 
is replacing the high marsh grasses, the Spartina patens or marsh hay, and the marsh gradually becomes inundated by seawater. Sea level rise is one of the effects of increased carbon dioxide on our, in our atmosphere, which contributes to the climate crisis. And this has huge impacts for our salt marsh critters, especially the salt marsh sparrow that only nests in the high marsh. A lot of important science and a lot of words and images not easily understood by the general public. So here we just have illustrations of those habitat types on the salt marsh. Um, you can see there's um, low marsh dominated by the tall cord grass or Spartina altiniflora, and that one is tolerant of, of much more flooding than the marsh hay or Spartina patens. Marsh hay is the one that the hayers used and, and still do actually. It's still the neat thing about Plum Island is a place where haying still occurs on a commercial level. And so this just explains, uh, this just illustrates uh, those different habitats. And the uh, Spartina patens or the marsh hay is the breeding area for the salt marsh sparrow. And as you see from the previous slide, if that area gets wet, um, that really has problems for that, that uh, sparrow that we know and love. Okay, this is um, rising ocean temperatures. That's one of the other. That's one of the consequences that uh, affects the organisms that we're, we're going to talk about. In fact, two out of the three of them, the rainbow smelt and the and the uh, fiddler crab, are affected in different ways uh, by the rising sea levels of uh, the rising ocean temperatures. But the Gulf of Maine is rising. Uh, the temperature is rising faster than just like ninety nine percent of all the rest of the ocean. And I think you could, those of you who went swimming this summer, it was like a bathtub. Uh, I've spent a lot of time swimming and snorkeling around here. And it was, uh, it reminded me of water that we expect off of the coast of New Jersey. So even though it's more pleasant for us to be swimming in, um, the consequences for the organisms that live here that, that are native to our area uh, are not so good. So warming waters are another impact of the increased carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. The Gulf of Maine ocean temperatures have been rising faster than 99.9% .9 of the world's oceans. That's pretty sobering. The picture on the right, again created by scientists at Pi LTER, was used a lot by Les and I on this project. Fiddler crabs are moving from the south to the north as a result of warming waters. So here we see the effects of more extreme weather resulting from climate change, including more intense precipitation and more prolonged droughts. We saw both of these this summer. More rains leads to spikes of discharge in rivers draining to the marsh with watersheds suffering flooding and floodwaters running into storm drains and rivers leading to the estuary. So the big question for Les and I that was posed by the Woods Hole scientist Anne Gibling and Nancy Powell after the 20, 2018 Great Marsh Symposium was how to convey this important information to children and adults who want to understand what's happening to our salt marshes. This is a, a graph from the uh, LTER project, and uh, what it shows is the spikes, the, the, the peaks that you see from those lines are periods of intense rainfall, intense storms, and it illustrates, if you look on the bottom of the graph or the x-axis, that's time starting from 1945 through roughly the present, 2015, and um, you'll notice that there's many more of these spikes of intensive rainfalls um, in, in the more recent years than there were in, in the first part of that graph. So it shows you, it's an illustration that storms are in fact getting in more intense. And, and these were taken from rainfall records from uh, around here. So 
So this year has been an, an incredible year of drought and scientists are still researching the effects of drought on the salt marsh. So this table is from the 1960s and shows the decline of mummy chogs during drought years. Um, this is a project I worked on early on when we started this LTR project. And what we did was compared 1990 when we started the project, the fish of, of two common salt marsh fish, one is the mummichog or salt marsh killifish, the other is a silver size. And these would be things you might think of as bait fish or um, from our perspective, turn food, cormorant food. Um, and in the 1960s, there was a drought much similar to what we have right now. Um, it was uh, a period of drought, and, and the first survey was done by the Div Division of Marine Fisheries then. And you can see the number of both those fish were quite a bit lower than in the 1990s when we started our surveys, which was a normal year. And it has to do with less water on the marsh, less places, uh, less area for the fish to spawn on, and, uh, and, and therefore lower numbers in the period of drought. And it'd be interesting to see what, uh, what would be happening after this year. Your favorite one. My favorite one. Waffles and maple syrup. Oh, man, waffle and maple syrup. So, yeah, this is a scientists occasionally do have fun with things. So, if we're, we're not all, you know, we, but anyway, um, one of the terms that was invented by, I think, Susan Adamovich, who is uh, a so scientist who works, often works at the Parker River Refuge. Uh, she's a regional biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it explains these, I don't know how easy it is to see, but you see, there's old ditches which were put in in the starting probably with, with uh, when people first started coming to the marshes for haying, but more intensively in the 30s for uh, mosquito control. And, and they built these parallel lines of ditching, which are very obvious, something like 95% of our marshes are, are ditched like that or have these ditches. And the, uh, what happens is the, the, the ditches will drain the marsh. And, and so you get uh, collapsing of the piece. So between the ditches, you often get ponding. And, it, and it, so you have a ditch, which can be in a nice grid pattern with a, in, in, in between the ditches is ponding. And that gives kind of this, if you, have, if you think of a waffle with maple syrup on it, it kind of looks, looks like that. <laughs> this one. Oh. Yeah. I guess I'm still on now here. You are. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this was a, another example of how things are getting wetter. This is by Vinton Valentine, who is a scientist who uh, is, well, worked for the LTR, but now is at the University of Southern Maine, um, a GIS guy. And what it shows is the, um, the blue lines were from the, uh, what were called T-sheets. These were, these were nautical charts done in, in the 1950s. And that shows where the open water was. And you can see what's interesting to me is a couple of things. One is the, uh, the, the ditches, the mosquito dishes, you can still see they were pretty stable. Um, um, but there really wasn't much ponding there. Now the black areas or the dark areas are current ponding areas. And you can see how the ponding has increased. And if you're familiar, this is the area around Stackyard Road. So uh, I'm sure my, uh, many of you have been out in that area um, uh, where, this, where this is uh, illustrated. So with all of this, Susan and I produced a story that became named the Once and Future Salt Marsh for the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, figuring out how climate change impacts the marsh as viewed through the life of three marsh critters, the smelt, the salt marsh sparrow, and fiddler crab. So we made an aesthetic decision to put silk paintings on the right and the scientific te text on the left. It provided a sense of consistency and we hope an elegance to the panels. This is the rainbow smelt panel located at the boat ramp across from the first parking lot on the refuge. It tells the story of the once abundant smelt in this area gradually becoming extinct because of warming waters. The vanishing smelt represents a loss to the ecosystem because the smelt are an important forage species for marine life 
and it's a huge loss to those who make their living from the waters of the marsh, including recreational and commercial fishermen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is really striking to me. I mean, they can't, this is on the Parker River. Can you imagine these days having, being able to have smelt houses? This is in the 1970s. I mean, if you really want to hit people in the gut, I, uh, this, is, this is really it. I mean, the fact that they could um, build these houses and people could actually have a winter fishery, uh, it just wouldn't happen these days. Um, now the smelt have disappeared from the southern part of their range. Um, they're, they're, it's not like they're extinct. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can find smelt when we did all our fish surveys, we would find it, but by no means anywhere near the numbers they used to be, and they no longer support this kind of commercial habitat, commercial fishery or recreational fishery. And obviously we can't, you'd have to go up to Maine to, to do winter smelt fishing like this. How many people here have smelted who went, as kids went smelting? I mean, you realize, you realize how an amazing memory that is? As a kid, I would go with my father and the neighbors. Okay, how many would go smelting? As a kid, I went with my father and our neighbors at night with a flashlight and a pail down to the stream, fished the smelt out and came running back to my mother where she had boiling water ready so we could have the smelt pretty much whole body, right? I think, yeah, with, with ketchup. Like for those of you who never knew smelting, I'm talking in Greek, but for everyone else, this is an incredible loss at a recreational and personal level. So this is actually a picture, a silk painting that I made of the smelt leaving our waters. And the concept I had was that it was turning into a ghost smelt. Oh, okay, <laughs> not again. No, <laughs> this is the salt marsh uh, sparrow panel located right by the salt pans. This, it tells the story of how this sparrow became a canary in the marsh. It faces possible extinction by 2050 because of sea level rise and storm surges drowning the sparrow fledglings in their low marsh nests. I'd seen a lot of pictures of drowned fledglings and it, well, they were really sad. It takes 60, 26 days for a salt marsh sparrow to lay her eggs on the high marsh and then hatch and fledge her chicks. She usually, she typically lays her eggs after a monthly high tide. And the nests allow the eggs to bloat and settle with a flood tide. But if there's a storm surge and there's young chicks in the nests, they face a horrible death by drowning. Yep, next one. Oh. Yeah, this is actually my favorite, my favorite silk painting of the salt marsh sparrow. And um, they're declining in numbers. Um, Nancy Powell told me the other day that there's a 9% a decline globally of salt marsh sparrows. But fortunately, the decline at the refuge so far is not so precipitous and Ro Robert will explain the science behind this. <laughs> Well, this is, uh, th by the way, that graph is not in the silk painting, just to be clear about that. <laughs> okay. uh, that's something I produced. Um, um, I have these uh, six breeding bird circles uh, on the salt marsh on the kind of the, the western side or the, uh, you know, not, not on the, the island uh, where Nancy Powell and her group does, does a lot of the same kinds of things. But these are the results from, from my surveys, and I think Constance, you helped out on at least one of those surveys. It was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and Dave Williams, who's the head of the, uh, who had been the head of the Brookline Bird Club, uh, um, I'm, had helped out. He, he actually still is done the counts. And uh, uh, Dave Weaver, yeah, he was one of the first people, so he, an ACOC member. So, so we all went out and did these breeding bird circles, and. The graph shows from 2004 to 2020 what the results were. And one of the things that strikes 
uh, strikes me is that it's very variable from year to year. There's a lot of natural variation, so that's what's real. Um, there's no real trend, I'd say, uh, over time, and this is contrasts with the the global situation. Well, for the salt marsh sparrow, it's the East Coast U.S. and that's it. We're the, we're responsible. We're species where we're responsible for because it's in our area down through roughly the, the mid-Atlantic states. And the real trouble of the, the, where they're really in trouble in this 9% decline is Southern New England through and points south. The, the decline or the situation in the Gulf of Maine of which the Great Marsh is a part is at the moment not as critical, um, but that's only temporary because eventually the sea level rise will will affect that area. And there are reasons for this having to do with tides that I need, we maybe we can get into with the question and answer, but uh, but um, we're out there monitoring and that's part of the point of showing you this, that we are here and, uh, and Nancy Powell and her group at the refuge are out here and more or less find, finds the same results that at least in our area, they're kind of holding their own, but the future is still looking um, not, not the best. Here's a very non-scientific anecdote. In the course of developing this project, Susan and I went out with some of the people from Parker River to find salt marsh sparrows. And I'm there with my camera. And these flying baked potatoes with little wings come up out of the marsh and hop along and fall back down again. And um, I realized that there was no real way for me to be able to photograph them, that that was going to be a very difficult kind of thing to do. But it led me to bringing my interest in birds to being as poetic as possible. So for me, these birds, this little critter is a flying baked potato. <laughs> this is our fiddler crab panel, which is located at Stage Island Trail by parking lot six on the refuge. And this slide shows you the, de the development of the fiddler crab silk painting at 10 pound studio. So, um, if anybody's interested in silk painting, you take a blank piece of silk and you stretch it on a stretcher frame, and then you outline what, what you're going to paint. And I use batik, it's, you, you use a resist, which encases the, the dyes because the dyes typically bleed. So if you want to have a drawing, you have to have them encased. And um, it shows you the development from beginning to end. So I thought you'd be interested in that. So the story of fiddler crabs slowly moving from the south to the Plum Island Marsh. It's, they're drawn by the warming waters. The larvae of the fiddler crabs can survive in temperatures over 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And the Gulf of Maine, which, as I said before, is warming so much, it's now warm enough for these larvae to su survive. And the jury is out whether the newcomer fiddler crabs cause ecological damage or not, because they burrow into the marsh mud. But they certainly change the ecosystem. And Robert will tell you a little bit more about the eco-engineering of the fiddler crab. <laughs> um. Well, fiddler crabs, if you've been to the Cape, uh, how many of you have been to Wellfleet and walked along the, the beaches there? Did you see any fiddler crabs? They're all over the place. It's not like you get the sense that they're at the northern limits of their range there. But when I first came, I did my doctoral work on Cape Cod, and fiddler crabs are just part of the landscape. And I came, started working, when I started working for Audubon and poking around uh, Freshwater Cove and Gloucester, I realized how something was missing. There was an organism, and it was fiddler crabs. You didn't see them. I'd occasionally see little holes in the marsh, but they were mussels that had burrowed into it. And so we just, it was just wasn't part of our fauna here. Um, but in 2012, 2014, one of the LTR scientists, Dave Johnson, who's at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, um, documented their occurrence in Plum Island. And since that time, they've come up as far, at least according to Dave, who studied these things intensively, they, they're up as far as uh, um, Booth Bay Harbor by now. But they weren't, they weren't there before this. And the consequences for the ecosystem, as Susan said, 
is really unknown. They are like earthworms. They burrow into the marsh, they aerate it, um, which for, from the point of your gardener, you think that's good for your, mar for your soil and perhaps it helps with, uh, there's even a theory of marsh uh, and the marshes in the past by an eminent marsh scientist that fiddler crabs were responsible for, uh, for the productivity of some of the marsh grasses because of their burrowing. Um, I, the person hadn't been up here yet, but uh, but um, yeah, so they're, they're, the jury is still out as to whether that effect is, I mean, they could be end up being a good food source for herons and egrets, which are, they're fed upon quite readily, uh, willets, um, but they also could really lead to more rapid decomposition. So it's just one of those interesting things that we'll have to wait and see. And just as an aside, the other creature that's really, um, seems to be showing up much, much more readily. Another crab is the blue crab. So uh, the Maryland Chesapeake Bay crab, um, um, they, they're, uh, they can be all of a sudden, uh, they, were, they were not very common here at all. They did occur, but very rarely. And people are seeing them more and more um, in this area. And who knows, maybe they'll become, maybe we'll be getting soft shell crabs from um, blue, our local blue crabs rather than from Maryland. So we focused on these three panels, which are at Parker River, but it wasn't supposed to happen. We had been working to produce a project that was going to be completely inside the visitor's center at Parker River, and COVID hit, and everything became uncertain. The panels that you've seen and will see again were designed in a vertical banner form to go inside the visitor's center. And what it meant was a complete redraw. This is a footprint from above of the visitor center at Parker River, where we had the opportunity to have an exhibit that was really going to cover every square foot of the wall space and be integrated with a story that we wanted to go forward on. It was so well integrated that we actually thought to put little um, plastic footprints leading from one part of the exhibit to the other, explaining what it was going to be like as a child standing in front of the exhibit. And that went all off the drawing board with COVID. And we had to start to think again. The great thing was I would get on the phone in the morning with Susan and she'd been talking with Robert or with Anne or Jane. And it was hours of editing time because everybody was remote and they all had the time to really focus on refining what the science was that was going to be printed. But that left us with a very big question called, what's it going to look like when it's outside? Because we hadn't planned for it with the project. This is a fanciful, imagined, photoshopped image of Susan sitting at the salt pans on a bench. And I just threw up as many panels as I could, because it was a big unknown. We had no idea how big they were going to be. Um, we knew that we were focusing on the critters. We know we wanted three panels, and we we're really hoping that it would come to be. Well. There was one piece that hit the, the floor, and that was the uh, Great Marsh timeline, where if you've been in the visitor center, down on the left, there's a wall. It's eight feet by six feet, and there really wasn't anything on it. It was inviting to have something on it, and we put a lot of time into creating a Great Marsh timeline. That never left the, the, the floor at all. We made it. So Robert looked at it and said, you know, I can't really can't read that. So for tonight, I, had, I, I made a cut at it to bring it as the three slides. Um, because each one of these paragraphs were researched and vetted and really thought about. I would also add that the, the photograph on the bottom is one of my panoramic photographs. Uh, 1880s, leave a minute to read this. It was a very ambitious piece. And what you really can't see above the photograph is a painting by, in the background, it's a painting by Arthur Wesley Dow, who lived in Ipswich. And when he went out, this is like we were talking about the long, long time, he would spend 10 years looking at the landscape before he would paint. And for me, it very much evokes Robert's point about the difficulty of showing science over a long time, because it's very, very precise. It moves slowly, assuredly, not assuredly, but it moves forward. There are many organizations working to um, understand and promote and protect the Great Marsh.
Oops. These are extra pages. Okay, I'll get there. We're good. This was really important where Robert insisted we put Nancy back in again. Why don't you say another word about Nancy? Yeah, yeah it's worse. She's no, what, what I thought we should say is some of the good stuff happening out there. And I think it's primarily happening through, um, well, I can talk about, I shouldn't say the only people, but four organizations are working a lot on addressing the problems with climate change on the marsh, making our marshes more resilient. Um, Mass Audubon is, uh, for example, is, is um, planning to put in a living shorelines at, J at Joppa Flats, a mussel reef, and, and it's an experiment to try and prevent <clears throat> or limit erosion of the shoreline, which is happening because the Merrimack is a big sweeping, uh, a lot of tidal energy comes through the Merrimack coming through. Um, this is um, the Parker River Refuge, Nancy Pow, and uh, one of the projects she's working on, and a, a major collaborator is University of New Hampshire, a bunch of uh, scientists there is actually healing the those ditches and so they're actually filling up the ditches um, with uh, grass in order to heal the ditches let the natural um, processes take over and it really works pretty well and this is actually happening um, around the salt pans between the salt pans and the hellcat dike in that section of the uh, of the um, marsh so if you, if you ever have a chance occasionally they nancy and folks from unh will run a um, a, high, a walk out there so you can actually walk out and see some of the great work that's going on there. Another place uh, uh, where some great work's going on is at the Old Town Hill uh, with the trustees land. So there's another obviously major player in this area, major landowner. And uh, the trustees are working with also with UNH to remediate fast, past farming practices. Um, one of the things that we're getting to realize through the work of primarily of Jeff Wilson and Susan Adamovich is that people were altering the hydrology or the flow of water in these marshes since colonial times. And the idea was they preferred, as much as we love salt marsh hay, they preferred the European grasses for their fodder. And so they would often put a berm in to keep the salt water out. Uh, and then behind that would get uh, things like Kentucky bluegrass, Timothy, and those sorts of things. And we can still see, um, at least Jeff Wilson can, he's got an incredible eye, can see the remnants of those berms that were put in and some of the contrivances that were there. And so the work at Old Town Hill is trying to basically replumb the marsh to be back at its uh, native hydrology. So there's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff going on. Essex County Greenbelt, we, we miss not to mention them. Um, and so just, there is, there is hope people trying to make the marsh more resilient to sea level rise. Thanks, Robert. So I took it upon myself to go out. The, the panels were installed last July, yeah. a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I said, OK, every quarter, I'm going to go out and photograph every panel, which would give me a, a kind of non-official way of looking at what the salt marsh conditions were in relationship to the panel itself. So this is from January of this year. And um, the far road is closed going out to Stage Farm. I actually hiked out three miles along the road to take the picture of it there. But I thought this was, it's been a worthy effort. And this is the panel. The, the next three panels shows the panels in mid-October of last October. We um, smelt. Salt marsh. And the fiddler crab. Should add that it was the work of the Friends of Parker River that did the fabrication of mm. the frames, which is amazing, and amazing printing. I mean, it's it's made it through the winter. One of the things they pointed out is that the wind, as you probably know at Parker River in the wintertime, is ferocious. So this work on the once and future salt marsh has actually propelled me to do a whole lot more silt painting work on the marsh. And this, this um, uh, panel is actually shown outside the auditorium. It shows the marsh during four, four seasons somewhat fancifully, but 
my interpretation. And Nancy Powell introduced me to the concept of carbon sequestration in the marsh, and I created this image uh, this year. Salt marshes absorb or sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it. The carbon is held in the vegetation, the marsh peat, the soils and sediments, which helps offset climate change because of the carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere. I just find this fascinating. <laughs> I don't know if you do, but I do. <laughs> and I become more and more fascinated by marsh mud and marsh roots. Last year, Anne Giblin introduced me to CAT scans showing how marsh roots are affected by extreme weather. And I was amazed how the roots fail to thrive under drought and storm conditions. And I wanted to interpret it through silk painting. So this is what I did. Um, and it was exhibited at the Cove Gallery in Gloucester last October. It's an artistic interpretation of marsh, marsh roots during ambient storm and drought conditions. And this is the painting that Janie alluded to. It's the uh, salt marsh sparrows facing extinction. You can see it in the climate action exhibit right now at, at the PEM. Um, and this is me and my daughter, Emma. <laughs> and we have a mother-daughter collaboration here. Emma is a ceramicist. She has a, a BA in ceramics from Alfred University. And she was inspired by my work on the salt marsh sparrow to do this collaborative piece with me. And I hope you have a chance to see it. Um, and finally, on to our next Art Informed by Science project. We are working with the River Valley Charter School in Newburyport on a project called A Child, the Great Marsh and climate change, climate adaptation. And um, we're collaborating with the PI LTER scientists as well as Nancy Powell on this project and working with a wonderful science teacher, Rebecca Schwer, and art teacher, Lucinda Cathcart at the River Valley Charter School. And we kick off in October, we're going to, the children, the seventh and eighth graders at the charter school, they're going to have their first uh, visit to the salt marsh this this um, sem semester, um, October third. So that's to come. <laughs> and do you want to tell about it? Yeah. So our web our website is www. I have to look at it. The great the once and future salt marsh. www the once and future salt marsh dot com, which has got a bit more information of how we've proceeded to create this project. You know, one thing I realized we need to point out is that Susan Silk painting and my photography, when it's combined together, has many times been printed on fabric. And so we have the dual advantage of her showing original art pieces and the ability to reproduce them electronically and print them digitally. And it makes it for a very mobile, uh, installation that can be deployed to different circumstances for different types of group. And that's, that's an important thing to say. Um, I've got nothing else to say at this point. We're gonna show the two pieces? Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say? Okay, all right. So that's our presentation, except Susan has two pieces, two silks that we wanna show you. Yeah. And we're gonna be the, okay. Robert and I are gonna hold them up. <laughs> All right. Yes, okay. In the front. okay, go in the front. All right, let me go by. So I wanted you to see what the original paint silk paintings looked like. This is the fiddler crab. So that's that one. And then I have the ghost smelt as well, the big one, Robert. I just thought it, you, it would give you an idea of what they actually look like. <laughs> That's it. And I hope people on Zoom can see them. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's it.
Thank you. Um, so would love to see if there's some questions from people. Yeah, we just moved actually down the road. Uh, we were on one center street. We were on the top of top floor of one center street. We're now just above Jalapenos on Main Street. We're at the West End Studios. Um, we're not open to the public yet, but you can contact me and I could give you a private tour okay. if you're interested. <laughs> um hard to say we we literally just moved this summer so i can't tell you right right now sorry <laughs> okay yeah so we're just we're asking you to use the mic only so that people that are joining us virtually and for the recording that they will hear so sorry to be don't mean to, mean to be pestering about it but um so leela if you want to take that and then maybe we could come back to you for your, your question? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, can you explain in a brief way uh, how the silk scarf, the silk work combined with the, combined with the photography? So, okay, thank you. I, I need to, you know, these, the, the panels at Parker River have these two a blend of these two components. As Susan said, on the right-hand side is the silk painting, a reproduction of it. And on the left is what we would call an info screen, a, a combination of text and graphics and a distillation of scientific um, research. In each one of the panels that we have at Parker River, there were weeks, if not a couple of months during the pandemic, where time was, was spent going back and forth to get details set and how the look would set. But, I know, but that doesn't answer your question. That's the setup. <laughs> the, the answer to your question comes from something that happened, first happened to us in the Marblehead Art Association, where I took a photograph of a woodland and Susan painted a silk version of it and we combined them in photoshop a layered blending and the blend hit everyone who saw it as this is something different what's going on here and it was at that point that i feel that our you know i talked about our being yin and yang and setting at the table differently right it's where our viewpoints of the world started to blend and that's an important distinction. So I brought it earlier. It's not that we're doing parallel work. There is this blending that takes place, and it only comes with time and a willingness to put up with somebody. <laughs> that, that answers your question, specifically me. But anyway, <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Um, just for one second to interject, I think that's such a wonderful example of two creative individuals coming together and creating okay. something that wouldn't have happened independently for either yeah, of you no. and the whole project really resonates yep. on that front for me i have a question for robert uh the uh, uh i i've heard about the plight of the salt marsh sparrow but i'm wondering about other species like nelson sparrow and seaside sparrow and maybe something i'm not thinking of that's kind of in the same boat yeah, well, there was a um, multi-investigator effort called SHARP, which stands for Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program. So it's got the acronym. And that was carried out by scientists from the University of Maine through the University of Delaware. Greg Shriver is one of them who you may have met. He did his PhD work at the Parker River. And they ass assessed, um, and, they're, and they're, still, they're still doing work on it, um, a lot of the marsh species, including Nelson sparrow, seaside sparrow, willets, uh, clapper rail. I think they even did black rail, um, or they even do black rail. And um, and the salt so, so marsh sparrow was the one that was declining most precipitously, the one that was declining at 9% per year. Seaside sparrow, as we know, is kind of at the northern limits of its range in, in the Parker River area. 
but seems to be holding its own um, much more than, than the saltmarsh sparrow. So the saltmarsh sparrow seems to be the one that's declining most uh, precipitously. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions, just pointing out, since many of you may not have seen, the panels um, in reduced form are out in the alcove here. Les very generously printed them and mounted them for us so that you could get a little bit of a feel for what those installations are like in the marsh. Thank you. A question for Robert. How are the little fiddler crab crabs migrating north? They, they took the ferry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that province town to Boston. No. The larva, the larva stages is their dispersal stage. stage. So they, presumably, what's interesting is if you think about Wellfleet, like it's right there where, that's actually the Gulf of Maine. So they were always there in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and uh, but if somehow they never made it, um, you know, around to our part of the Gulf of Maine. It's always in that very extreme southern part of the Gulf of Maine. So presumably some currents carry them forth, and that's the way they they got there in the larval stages. Which a lot of these marine critters, that's the way they disperse. But the thing is, the point is that the water is warm enough that the larva could survive. The larva could have always been you know, in the in our area, but that just was too cold for them to survive. But now, at least they get a couple of good years. They're just to point out they're they're by no means common in the Plum Island uh, area. It's certainly nothing compared to what you see in Wellfleet. They're they're still pretty uncommon. And Dave Johnson just said something like no more than one tenth the population size is what you get up in some of the more denser areas of fiddler crabs where they're all over the place. But nonetheless, they're here, and the thought is that they're they're here to stay. Susan asked me to, um, excuse me, interject that this is a great kickoff being here tonight because the Essex Trails and Sales events tomorrow, which is Saturday and then Sunday, um, you'll find us manning the various um, panels that we have tomorrow and Sunday. I know you're going to be there tomorrow for a bit. Yeah, so is it, are you there Sunday? I'm going there tomorrow, but it's, okay, not Sunday. You can't, you can't. It's not like I can twist my arm to go to the refuge. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you, when you come into the gate, they have a, a brochure to hand out to people so you can actually see the panels and we'll be there to talk a little bit more. That's all on that. Between 11, and Between 11 and 2. Susan, I have a question for you. Um, what got you interested in painting on silk? It seems like, oh. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Ah, uh, the answer is a strange answer. <laughs> I was sitting in sy synagogue <laughs> and the rabbi was delivering um, a sermon, uh, which was boring me a lot. <laughs> he was flanked by two silk paintings that had been painted by Kate Seidman and Ruth Mordecai of Gloucester. And I couldn't keep my eyes off these silk panels. And at the end, I decided I had to learn silk painting. <laughs> and by chance, Kate Seidman was teaching silk painting at the YMCA in Gloucester. And that's how I got started. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Other questions or comments from people? Well, what an incredible treat to have the three of you here. Um, all your different perspectives, the blending of it, so special. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.